Greetings from Witch Chapel United Methodist Church, and thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. We invite you to worship with us. Our Sunday worship times are 8 a.m., 9.05 a.m., 10.10 a.m., and 11.15 a.m. We're located off Highway 291 between Woods Chapel Road and Lakewood Boulevard in Lee Summit, Missouri. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach us at 816-795-8848, extension 321. We hope you find this message meaningful and relevant in your daily life. Let's stand for our scripture lesson from 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. Finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers and sisters. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Dear friends, this is the word of the Lord. May God send his Holy Spirit to bless it to our hearts as we gather in his name today. Please be seated. Today is the first Sunday of Lent. Lent is 40 days prior to Easter, more or less, that the historic church has set aside for Christians to consider the suffering and death of Jesus. I want you to do that. Uh, during Lent. But this year we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to spend 40 days talking about God's love. And um, I want to do that because behind the cross, before the cross, because of the cross, there, there is this great theme behind it all that God loves us and that in this life, we have a great opportunity to know him and walk with him, to be blessed by him. And I want to begin today by a very simple question about you and the life that you're living. Is this something that you look at and see as a great gift from a God who loves you? Is your life something to love and celebrate? Or what's the alternative? To to not? Sometimes circumstances do not make this easy. Let's just be honest with ourselves. There are things that happen to us. There are things that happen around us. It is very easy to get stuck on all that is wrong in life. The list would go on and on. Wars, sickness, financial problems, hatefulness, worry, rejection. And it doesn't matter how many good things happen in a week. You know, when there's one just kind of raunchy little unhappy thing, those are the things that tend to stick with us. Car wrecks cancer. All of us have sat around from time to time and wondered about loved ones or children who have had difficult things happen to them. It is easy to hang our heads and be frustrated. It is easy to forget, easy to forget that life is a great gift from God. Now, sometimes we can blame circumstances, but sometimes I think we have to take some responsibility ourselves for being negative. I'd like to think that it's just other people, other places, 
but I catch myself being there sometimes, and I'm sure if you were honest with yourself, you've had times where you catch yourself and think, what have I allowed my brain to trail down in, into this uh, uh, set of, of unhappy thoughts? It's just, it's just the human way that, that in the midst of, of good and amazing things, sometimes we just can't see it. And, and one of my favorite stories is of a guy who buys a, a new bird dog and he's going to go duck hunting, and he takes his new dog out, and he sees the duck, and he shoots the duck, and the dog goes to get the duck running out across the water. And he brings the duck back, walking on the water, and the guys say, that's pretty exciting. That's, like, amazing. So he spends a couple of hours shooting ducks and watching the dog run out to on the water to get the duck and and bring them back and he's so excited he can't contain himself he's got a share so he goes and gets a neighbor says, come on over here and shoot some ducks i want you to see my new dog and so they shoot some ducks and one after another the dog goes out walking on the water gets the duck and brings it back the neighbor doesn't say anything and finally the guy again can't contain himself he says to the neighbor so what do you think of my new dog isn't my dog amazing and the neighbor says, oh, you know, uh, you may have wasted your money. Uh, that bird dog does not know how to swim. <laughs> and all around us, all around us, there are amazing things. Amazing things. The miraculous hand of God at work but our brains just get stuck in the fact that the dog doesn't know how to swim. Some people get perpetually stuck in being negative. Their glass is always half empty, and you know who these folks are because you cringe when you see them coming. They have the same old pile of complaints. They are walking, self-fulfilling prophecies by the way that they carry themselves, by, by the spirit that comes out of them, the very things that they hate about life continue to come to them because no one wants to spend time with someone who is always constantly unhappy. But we have a choice. And if there's anything I want you to walk away from this today is to, to understand, you have a choice in how you live and how you breathe and how you think. The scripture tells us that those who love life must keep their tongue from evil. What does that mean? Well, at the, in, in the basest form, it means close the mouth. Just stop saying those negative things. Even if you can't change your heart, even if you can't change the way you think, it clearly means that we should stop using the muscles in our mouth and the gift of voice. Just, just close it. But it means more than that. We have to understand that when we engage in negative talk, whether it's about someone or about circumstances, we are just bringing everything down. You know, you might think you're just blowing off a little steam. But if you do it enough, you're just bringing everything down with you. That's why we're not watching the news so much. I mean, regardless of what side of the aisle you're on, I mean, I watch the news and I think, is there nothing good in our world? Is there nothing good in our world? Isn't there something good to say somewhere in some town, in some city? In some, isn't there something good somewhere? When we give place to negative speech in our life, it brings everything down. When we're asked to not be negative, we also have to understand that the choice is to, instead of being negative, to be positive. And really, friends, we can't do both at the same time. James wrote in chapter 3, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Well, it's not just that it shouldn't be. 
it shouldn't be the case that Christian people are being negative. It's actually impossible for blessings and cursings to come out of your mouth at the same time. If I think my wife's dinner was terrible and I'm giving voice to that, which I would never do, why is he all bandaged up today? <laughs> when you give your mouth to negative things, you can't say the positive things. If I'm complaining to you about somebody over there, I, I, I've just wasted five minutes of our time when God has given us this voice, this mind, this heart to build one another up and fill one another with love. To stop the negativity means that we choose to replace it with the good. Are things bad or are things good? Is life bad or is it good? You, you decide. You look at it. You see what's there. You decide. What is it? Story of a guy that gets on the Greyhound bus. He's going on a trip. There's one seat left. And of course, you know how these stories go. The person he has to sit by is very undesirable. Who's the undesirable that he has to sit by? A hippie. I take some offense to that in the story, but what do you do? So he sits down next to the hippie, and, and he notices that the guy only has one shoe. And he says, oh, young man, I, I see you've lost a shoe. And the hippie says, no. I found a shoe. And you know, folks, we all have our stuff. And I do not for a minute want to... Everybody's stuff is an equal. There are people in our congregation that are facing very difficult, challenging things. But regardless of the size or scope of what it is that you face, it, it all has the ability to bring you down if you choose to let it do that. On the other side of every moment, though, is an opportunity to see the good. I want to tell you a story uh, from my life. Uh, if I've told you this story, stop me, and I'll do something else. But uh, about four years ago, my wife started to travel, like three, four days a week. And I found myself alone or at home with a senior in high school, which is about the same as being alone, you know, because... <laughs> uh, for the first weeks or months, I was consumed. I was overwhelmed with a feeling of... Loneliness, loneliness. Man, did you see that in that story? And I would suffer when she was gone. And I was thinking, this can't go on like this forever. I read something that totally turned my brain, my heart. The author was talking about the difference between being alone and being lonely. And my ears perked up and the lights started to come on and he said, basically, what I heard him saying is, if I spend all the time that she's gone suffering and missing her, I'm wasting every day, every hour that God has given me to live while she's gone. I'm saying that life is terrible unless she's here, and it's kind of insulting to God. If things aren't just the way I want them to be, then the rest of my life is lousy. And it's not that I don't miss her or shouldn't miss her, but I began to consciously choose to ask myself, what is here on Tuesday that is good? What is here on Tuesday night, when she's in Minnesota or wherever, what is it that is good? And I looked around me, and you know what's there? All of you. 
and things to read and things to learn, ways to grow, cupboards to clean. The point is we can't, we can't throw away life just because this piece of it isn't going exactly the way we want it to. And I've grown. And I still miss her, but my brain and my heart a little, are a little more healthy. Not so our neurotic little dog <laughs> who thinks his life is terrible if she's not there. And you know, he can barely hear and he can barely go up and down stairs, but he can hear her garage door open. He knows the sound of her car pulling in the garage and he'll run like a puppy and he'll stand on the door and he'll scratch the door and he'll beep, 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 beep. I say to him, act like a man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and it takes forever for her to come in because she's got to get out suitcases and stuff and she's dragged. Beep, 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 beep. And she comes in and she knows the gig because she can hear him on the other side of the door and she comes in and, and he just pawing at her and doing his thing because his life is nothing unless she's there. The rest of his life he just hates. I, on the other hand, <laughs> I miss her. I'm glad when she's home, but I'm not wasting Tuesday and Wednesday missing her. Do not allow yourself to miss the gift, the wonder, the good of life because there is something in your world that is unhappy or difficult. Peter says if we would love life, if we would learn to find that, that feeling of goodness about life, that we must love as brothers or sisters. That is so, so important. Are there Christian friends in your life? Are there people that you are connected to that are good for you? How healthy it is to have people to, to, to walk this journey with together. And so often when people are in my office or I hear a story about someone that's broken and struggling, they have no significant friendships in their lives. And if you're here today and you're feeling what I'm talking about, we weren't created to be alone. There are people to, to walk this journey with you. There are people to celebrate this life with you. Find them. Love as brothers and sisters. Peter says, also, be compassionate and humble. And you know, when I'm all upset about all the things that are wrong, when I'm all negative about all the things that are wrong, there isn't very much that's compassionate or humble about me or any of us. But when we take our eyes off of the circumstances and look to the God who loves us and has blessed us and gifted us with this life, then our hearts are filled with appreciation and joy, and we begin to look outside of ourselves towards others with hearts of compassion and love. This is how we find the peace that he's talking about, seeking peace. It's not by complaining about what's wrong. It, it, it's not by trying to scratch and grab to ourselves all the things we think that are missing. It's by learning to see the gift that is here. We find peace by, by, by looking and seeing God's action in the world around us every day. That's how we become a blessing. Not by being unhappy, but by seeing that God has blessed us. When it snowed yesterday, don't raise your hands. Were you more unhappy or happy? <coughs> Were you complaining and negative about the snow? Or did you say, oh, what a beautiful snowstorm. God, thank you that my son got his car stuck in the 
church parking lot. <laughs> God, thank you for the feeling of, of winter. There's so much beauty around us, and spring is getting ready to pop, and it's such a time of hope. There's flowers and rivers and beautiful things. The daffodils are, are getting ready to come up over on, on the North Shore. So much beauty in life if we just look to see what's there. And I'm telling you, friends, when we walk past our flowers, when we walk past the birds and our trees and we don't even notice them, mm, mm, I hate to use the word sin but I'll, in that context, but I certainly will say how drastically unfortunate that the great, wonderful gifts of God's love are being ignored by those who walk right by them. We talk about sunsets. How much we enjoy sunrises and sunsets. I was talking to somebody last week, and they said that uh, they like to chase sunsets. I said, what? What is that? What are you talking about? They said, well, when we see one that we really like, we get in the car and we drive west. Not above the speed limit, but west. And we've learned where the high places are, where we can go from this hill to that hill and see it again. Do you see in that story a heart that is pursuing the goodness of God as gifted to us in this life. We have a choice of what we will see. And I am not asking you today to see the glass as half empty or half full. I am asking you today to see the world that God has given you, to see the life that God has given to you and see his mighty act of love in every little thing. I'm not saying to you that, that life is full of miracles. I'm saying to you that life is a miracle. And if we would learn to love this life and celebrate this God, it just begins with getting off of the negative and seeing what he's put right in front of our faces. There's a little movie that uh, came out in the 80s. It's really dated. It's about a guy who, uh, he has the most droll and terrible life. He works on an assembly line putting caps on like milk jugs, right? And he's standing there all day long and the milk, I, I, I shouldn't smile because he's not happy when he's doing this. And one day on the way home, he finds this music box and, and he picks it up and opens it up and into this world of, of sadness and darkness and it's kind of a steel town, everything's gray and smoggy, but these angels pop out of the music box and begin to sing joyful songs of hope and those songs get in this guy's life and the whole rest of the movie, he's kind of dancing around and he's hiding the music box from his wife because he wouldn't possibly know how to explain it to her, you know. Something happens inside of him and, 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 and he's, he's changed this, this celebration of, of the goodness of God's love in this world just changes him totally. And at the end of the movie, uh, he's, he's standing on top of this building holding the music box out like to the whole city, like, see my joy, hear God's love, see what it's all about. And you know, the thing I love about this story is the, the city is still dark. There's still smog. He still has the same <laughs> rotten job as before. The only thing that changed was him. And we have a choice to see the good, to see God's love all around us in this world. And during these 40 days, we have a, uh, an actual physical expression that we want to invite you to participate in. We've made 200 packets, and I think there are more coming, of note cards. It says, 
40 Days of Love. They're available in the bookstore, and they're free. Okay. Pick one up, and over the next few weeks, what we're asking is that you write one note every week to someone you love or to someone who has done something that touched you. Dear Jerry Meisenheimer, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for all you have done. Dear Mark, thank you for being a good husband. Thank you for being a man that I like to be around. Dear Cindy, thank you for the example that you have set during times that are so difficult to imagine. So, we're going to end the service in a minute, but I'm asking you to continue uh, these thoughts by picking up some notes. And if you like to write a lot of notes, after you use these up, get your own note cards, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for the miracle of you at work in our world. Thank you that you draw us out of the sorrow, out of the sadness. You turn us loose. You, you light us on fire to celebrate life. Thank you for every person here, every moment, every opportunity that we have to love you and love one another. Keep up your work in us. In Jesus' name, amen.